Swatson 00616, uh, can I do a tutorial of in-car run as to everything we're doing during the run? What switches are we flipping, levers are we moving, uh, etc. Maybe even start with how you start the car, what the crew guy is spraying in the scoop, how does the clutch's transmission shift, etc. Big time fan and follower, thank you. Uh, good luck in 2019 season, thank you. Uh, absolutely, this is awesome. All right, I'm going to take you guys through a start to finish process uh, of what it's like to make a to make a run in the shadow, to make a run in a blown alcohol supercharged car. Um, it's pretty in depth. It's pretty critical, uh, and, and nearly everything that we're going to talk about is exactly engineered uh, and, and very methodical. I firmly believe that if you practice and train even in testing doing the same thing every time you'll end up with a more consistent product on the racetrack and I'll be more consistent driving it. Uh, me and Billy downloaded a bunch of our runs or we were looking at a bunch of downloaded runs from our season. Um, when you blow them all up it's it's very awkward uh, looking I say awkward it's very uncanny um, except for a few runs where we have some staging battles uh, any run that we made over the course of the year, there's never more than three to four seconds from the time the engine fires to the time I roll it into the beams. Um, that's a very consistent, basically it's a consistency based time frame, but it affects everything in the car. Cylinder head temperature, transmission fluid temperature, rear end fluid temperature, tire temperature, uh, how much fuel's in the tank. These things burn fuel at a, at, at a rapid rate of speed when they're idling. Not as fast as a nitro car, but they gulp fuel pretty fast. You let it sit up there for 30 more seconds, 40 more seconds, it's lighter in the nose. It's going to change how it reacts. Um, so basically, uh, we're sitting up there. I'm strapped in. I have on way more crap. Uh, we got on uh, fire suits and no mix underwear and helmets and skirts and gloves and shoes and over boots. And if they make it, believe me, I wear it. Uh, Hans devices. Um, I say all the time, I love this race car, but we can replace this. Uh, I love me more. Um, so the, st the starter's up there. I got my eye on the starter. We've got a guy in the other lane. Just say we're getting ready to roll into a qualifying run at the NHRA race. Me and the, uh, whoever's starting the race car, we've got a very intimate relationship. It always starts with that. Um, we were talking earlier about what we squirt into the engine, into the scoop. Uh, basically, to start these cars, they run a mechanical fuel system. They don't spin over fast enough to generate fuel pressure. So what you see them squirt into the injector is basically just methanol. Uh, if it's above 60 degrees outside, it's just straight methanol. If it's colder than that, we'll mix a little gasoline in it to fatten the motor up when it starts. Basically, they're giving the engine enough fuel to ingest to start until it can build RPM and run on its own. Uh, when that guy's standing in front of the car, um, you'll generally see the experienced one stand off to the side and barely lean in front of the car because they've seen some bad stuff happen. These things are mechanical beasts that can blow up at any time. Um, but when I'm starting the car, I'm worried about that man's safety. Uh, me and him never lose eye contact. The starter has given us the sign to fire. The guy in the other lane fires. It generally takes them longer than it does me to do a burnout and back up. I think me and Todd Tuttero uh, probably could do a burnout, back the car up and stage it in about 15 seconds. Um, a lot of people take a lot longer. So I generally let the other guy get rolling. Um, uh, you know, two reasons. One, I don't want to get held up and, and overheat the engine. Uh, two, my process is just faster than most people's. Um, guys rolling over there. I'm looking at him. Uh, generally, the man that squirts, uh, or lady, that squirts uh, methanol in the injector controls the throttle. On my team, we don't do that. From the time it's time to start the car until I turn off or turn road, this is my office. Uh, I control the throttle even when we start it. Um, so he gives me the eye signal. I snap the injector plate uh, open, and uh, they give it a give it a squirt of fuel. Close the injector blade. He's looking at me. I'm looking at him. He gives me the nod. He's ready. I give him the nod. I'm ready. Uh, very important thing here. When this thing starts, I've got about 800 pounds of brake pressure. Even though I know that this thing's in neutral and I know it's not going to take off and run over him, I've got enough brake pressure on this thing to hold it here pretty good. My right foot, my throttle foot, is tucked in up under my left foot. Uh, I make sure that I've, I'm doing everything that I can do, make sure my foot's not on the gas pedal, everything that I can do uh, to, to take care of that guy. When these things fire up, um, it, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty awesome. Uh, so he gives me the sign, I give him the nod, ignition switch out, hit the starter button, and this thing roars to life. Um, I like for it to run for about 10 seconds. You'll see me just sit there for a little bit. I'm watching the engine RPM come down. I'm watching the oil pressure come up. 
I watch the head temp start ticking off. I'm looking at CO2 pressure. They come over, unplug the, the starting uh, accessory booster pack, shut the door, latch that door. That's the last time that door opens, uh, unless there's a problem. Gives me the thumbs up and it's time to roll it into the water. All right, the hardest thing to do uh, for most people driving an automatic, uh, we run a torque converter. Uh, we don't have a clutch. If we had a clutch, the driver would have his, have his foot on the clutch. The car would basically be in neutral with the, the clutch not engaged with the transmission. With an automatic, as soon as the engine fires, the, the transmission uh, is spinning, the shaft is spinning. You have to stop that from spinning to put this thing in gear. The hardest thing for everyone that starts driving an automatic blown Pro Mod is putting it in gear. The engine RPM is really high. The output shaft or the internal shaft in the transmission is spinning really fast. Um, it sounds really weird, but the first thing you have to do to put this thing in gear is you have to take your foot off the brake. Uh, if the car's bound up, it won't go in gear. Um, so you you know you're ready to put this thing, you're ready to roll it in the water, foot off the brake, which is very, uh, you'd be amazed how hard that is to do when this thing's running and it sounds like it's going to eat you. Uh, you'll always see me reach over, trans brake buttons on the right, right hand side of the steering wheel. I'm going to give that thing a double tap. I'm going to, when, when I do that, I'm sliding the forward, uh, I'm, I'm sliding the, the reverser, sliding the, the shift selector towards the forward position. I can feel the teeth in the reverser turning. When I give that thing a double tap, I will I actually can, I, I'm not putting pressure on it to where it's grinding but I've got just enough pressure on it where I can feel the transmission winding down. Uh, when that thing starts to wind down, I'll feel that sweet spot and boom, it'll fall right into gear. When it falls into gear, I'll reach up, I'll tap it backwards twice to make sure that it's in, uh, in forward all the way and then start rolling forward. With a supercharged car, we, we fry in high, uh, meaning we do the burnout in high gear. So the button on top of the shifter, that's a shift override button. Um, I'll hit that thing once, shift it in the second, Hit it normally when I'm rolling into the water, shift it into high gear, uh, and, and it's ready to do the burnout. I'm rolling through, of course, foot back on the brake pressure, uh, foot back bump back on the brake pedal. If you took your foot off the brake pedal on this car um, and had it in high gear and just let it idle, it would probably run about 50 to 60 miles an hour uh, because it idles at you know right at 2,000, a little over 2,000 RPM sometime. So it takes a decent amount of brake pressure to, to hold it there running. Uh, when we get done running, you know, my brake, brake pedal's leg is tired. So we roll that thing in. Uh, Jack's up there. He's lining me up left or right where he wants it to burn through. A lot of that has to do with the crown of the racetrack. A lot of it has to do with where I want to do a burnout through. Sometimes on certain racetracks, I don't want to burn through where I'm going to take off. So he's moving me a tire length to the left, tire length to the right. Uh, just trying to make sure that I don't mess up the starting line. If the starting line's perfect, I'm not going to burn across it. I don't want to tear it up. I don't want to modify it. I don't want to do anything. If it's the right temperature, it's firm and looks good, I'm going somewhere else. Uh, so we roll through. Uh, I have a very peculiar and unique burnout style. Um, I get asked about it a lot. It stems from the first real race car pro mod that I saw with Scotty Cannon. Um, and then the first fuel car I saw was John Force in Atlanta when they didn't have throttle stops. So as a kid, I remember funny cars rolling through the water, wah, 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 and then they'd settle that thing on the burnout. Um, that's ingrained into my being as a human. I can't get out of there. So when I roll through, I like to give her the wah, 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 and then settle it into the burnout. And uh, basically, I'm driving a fuel car in my mind is what's happening. Burnout, absolutely the most fun part of the run. Uh, the, the least amount of control that we have in the race cars during the burnout. Um, I like to think of myself as a burnout connoisseur, but it's really easy to wreck one of these things in the burnout. You've got a, you've got a, you've got a completely locked rear end uh, with a spool, two enormous tires that are turning at the same speed. You've rolled through water, and now you're going to stomp the throttle down on your 4,000 horsepower blower motor keep it about 7,500 RPMs, and hold it there for about five seconds. Uh, it definitely, we as drivers make it look a lot um, more effortless than it is. 
Uh, I would love to have a camera on some people the first couple times they try to do a burnout in one of these cars. But I roll through the water, give it a little crack of rooski, uh, get it up on the tire. And then really, the length of the burnout, normally Billy's yelling at me to shorten it up. The first burnout of the weekend on an NHRA weekend, I'm going to take it a little long. I'm fired up. I'm jacked up. Uh, the tires haven't had a run on them. We don't get to test uh, NHRA Pro Mod. Uh, so I'm going to burn it out generally about when I go, when I see the tree go by, I'll generally step off. If I'm feeling froggy, I'll take it on out a little bit. Uh, if the track's really hot, I'll shorten it up. I'll just roll right across the starting line and crack the throttle. Um, we monitor everything on these vehicles. Uh, tire temperature when it leaves the start line is very critical. I'm aiming for a tire temperature when it leaves the start line. Due to burnout, ah, you know, that thing, I call it barking it like a seal, but it barks the tires when it stops and you roll out there. Um, first thing to do is get it in neutral. It's the same process as putting it in gear going into the burnout. It's really difficult. Take your foot off the brake pedal. Double tap the trans brake, feel it go into neutral, double tap uh, in reverse and you're ready to go back. Now, people back up with different styles. Uh, my guys included are talking to me on the radio, telling me left, right. Generally, I'm looking at my target at the finish line um, and I'm backing the car up in the same target line that it's gonna go down the racetrack. I shift my car to high gear. I, I back up decently fast, and I want to be able to back up fast. So as soon as it starts rolling, I'm going to shift it in a second. I'm going to shift it into high, and then I'm going to come on back. Jack's on the radio telling me left, right, left, right. Most of the time, I either don't listen or don't pay attention. I'm, 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 I'm aimed at my target at that, that time. Uh, when I get to the tree, you'll see me slow down, and then I'm listening to him. I want to make sure that we're, that we're in sync. We're in the right spot. <laughs> with your with your lineup boy or girl and their 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 tone of voice means a lot um, a lot of times as drivers we're in our own head and when I'm backing up I'm thinking about don't have a bad light or I'm thinking I just screwed the burnout up or I'm thinking there's a pretty girl in the stands over there or any a number of things uh, and Jack will be telling me left 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 if I'm not turning left enough his voice will change left 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 and then I know I need to pay a little more attention and get that thing over left um, so that's, you just got to get, that's, that's one reason why it's very important to have the same people doing the same job all the time. Um, I can tell the way Jack says left or right on the, on the radio whether I need to turn the wheel here or turn the wheel here. Um, back that thing up, put it in neutral. Uh, everyone has a different process of pulling to the beams. Mine's exactly the same. I'm going to stop. We're going to stop 20 feet from the starting line, which is about uh, a car length in one of these, a little bit further depending on the water. We're, I'm going to put it back in gear. And we're going to basically get the car set up to make a run. He's going to get it exactly where he wants it. Billy's in there consulting. They're talking about a little left, a little right. Me, all I'm doing is looking at my target at the finish line. Uh, I don't look at the finish line. I look at the farthest thing I can see as far as far away on the racetrack down the line I want to go. And, and that's where I'm, I'm making my last-minute adjustments. If it's anything gross, uh, left or right, they'll be talking to me. Um, we'll pull that thing up about six feet. I put it in neutral, and then we're there kind of waiting on the other guy. They set the wheelie bars, doors fanning the, the last little bit of smoke out of, the, out of, out of here. Um, I'll shut the door, thumb latch it, turn on my fresh air. Uh, basically, it's just a compressed scuba air, uh, outside air. Uh, it's in a tank. Pretty much the main reason for that is it makes it where the visor won't fog up, uh, and it gives you a little bit of non-methanol infused air, which I love the methanol infused air. I wish we could get some perfume that smelled like, uh, like methanol. Pretty much the thing's sitting there idling and I'm staring at the head temperature. Right now, when I'm up there, that's the most important number. As long as it's got oil pressure, I know the motor's running, I want that head temperature a certain number. These things are very finicky on cylinder head temperature. You get them hot, it pisses them off. You get them cold, it makes them lazy. Uh, I know what tune-up Billy has in it. I know we're trying to run and I'm aiming for a number. Um, the guy over there, uh, generally, 
I have structured my burnout uh, and everything and how long it's run kind of by that anyway. So I kind of know where I'm at. Engine's heating up a degree every eight, eight to 10 seconds at that point. It's not really heating up rapid. Um, I'm looking at his crew chief, staring at the tree, um, generally thinking about kind of nothing at that point. The worst thing we can do as a race car driver is start thinking about driving the race car. Um, I get asked all the time, you know, how are you such a consistently good lever? And the biggest thing I can tell you is quit thinking about it. Um, if I'm in the lane where I can see the tree good, I generally I'll be staring at the tree like this and I'll just kind of be looking at it and just, you know, I'm really relaxed. It looks like we're jacked up, but I'm relaxed. They'll be on the radio and they'll tell me, all right, that guy's ready to pull in. I'll give it the customary, rev it up a little bit and give it a little pop, pop. Uh, I like to give it a little burp. Uh, it gets me fired up. It's my signal to my internal clock. It's time to tear this man's head off or lady's head off on the tree. Car goes in gear, click, click, boom. No foot on the brake, kids. Um, pull it up. Uh, guys lining me up in the beams. Push yourself back in the seat. Generally at this time, I will I've already double checked or triple checked my belts. Um, my belts are sewn in a fashion to where I tighten them up. Uh, generally here, I'm gonna reach up and I'm gonna give myself another, I, I wanna be bolted in this thing. Uh, pull me up about six inches in front of the beams and stop me. At that point, I could care less about anything in the instrumentation. Don't care if it's got oil pressure. Don't care about if it's got transmission pressure. Don't care if the cylinder's on fire. Uh, as long as there's no fluid running all over me and I'm not on fire, Everything else in the world can go away. I'm focused on that tree. It is my job to destroy the person in the other lane on the starting line. Uh, as a race car driver, our job is to take care of the equipment, not wreck it. But the main thing is, is if I can't beat them off the starting line, you're not going to have a job at this very long. Pull up. Uh, I'll generally be putting, you know, light pressure on the brake, 220, 230 pounds. Um, I've got it on the dash. I'm not looking at it. I know what it takes to, to hold the car. Uh, I've got this elbow locked dead into here, dead into this X. Uh, hand on the steering wheel. I'm pushed into the seat as tight as I can go. Foot on the brake. Uh, very small movements going in. Um, if there's a little, if they've made a mistake and kind of where it's pointed, or I have, there'll be a little last minute correction. Generally at this time, kind of where it's pointed is where it's going. The worst thing you can do when it leaves the starting line is turn the wheel. Uh, these things don't set the front tires down for about 300 feet. I pick a spot, there's a, there's a spot where my elbow's put together that fits in that roll bar good. Um, and generally, I won't touch a steering wheel, whether it's going left, right, straight, until it sets the front end down. That's a, a feeling that you just kind of have to have. The worst thing you can do is start driving it with ease the starting line, because when it lands, if you've got the steering wheel like this, it's gonna dart into the wall. Um, light the top bulb, got some brake pressure. They've got their top bulb on. This is where a lot of people put way too much thought into it. Um, going in first, going in last. Everybody's got a pattern they like to do, uh, whether they want to go in first or go in last. For me, um, my pattern is to not establish a pattern. I really could care less. You can let me sit there for an hour, or I can go right in on top of you. Uh, it makes no mind. When I'm qualifying, when I'm testing uh, every day, every time I go down the racetrack, I make sure I do something different just so I don't ever get into a slump. Um, generally qualifying, all I'm thinking about is getting the car stayed shallow so that we have a good reaction time. Um, and, and really that's it. Race day is a little bit different mindset. You're a little less focused on ET. Uh, where we're at racing over here, a hundredth of a second can move you from fourth place to 10th place. So we're really focused on getting the, the car shallow. These things are hard to stage shallow. Like I said earlier, they're idle at over 2000 RPMs and they move a lot when you take your foot off the brake, pre, uh, brake pedal. Um, so I'll stage it. We got four bulbs lit up. At this point, I am giving it the five finger discount. Now the five finger discount, is something that I developed in the Philippines in 1945. Uh, a lot of guys wrap your hands around the steering wheel. That's what feels safe. Uh, a lot of guys will poke at the button. A lot of guys will use this finger. People will use this finger. All kind of, every driver's different. I give them the five finger discount. I believe that the fastest reaction time uh, is if you initiate the movement from the largest muscle group, which at this point would be my shoulder. My hand's stiff. I'm about to give whoever's in the other lane the five finger discount. Light on the button. As hard as this sounds, this takes a tremendous amount of practice. You cannot mash the button. If you match the button, that's 200 of reaction time. You got a, you got this beast running that makes 4,000 horsepower. It's drinking 
fuel at a high rate of speed. It's stinky in here. There's still tire smoke coming through from the tubs. You're about to push this button and stomp your foot to the floor and don't have a lot of pressure on it. Now think about that in your mind. That's hard. Brake pressure in, a little bit of pressure on the button. This is the trans brake. This is what holds the car on the starting line. I'm going to hold two to 300 pounds of brake pressure, swap feet, stomp it, and then as soon as I get that down, I'm subconsciously letting off of the brake. Still four bulbs on, nothing's happened. In your mind, this happens really fast. You think, I stomp the brake, hit the button, stomp the gas, let go of the brake, and boom, the tree's there. In reality, it takes about 10 times that long. It's normally 1.1 to 1.3 seconds from the time I push the button to the time I let go of the button. Now, one 1,000. Sure, that sounds fast. In racing terms, that's an eternity. Um, hand on the button. As soon as you I'm, – I'm, other mistake that drivers make, uh, and, and fans don't know this, if you just look at the tree, you're not going to have a good light. Um, I'm looking at the, the bulb that's on my side, the very top bulb. I think that it takes longer for electricity to get to the bottom bulb than it does the top bulb. I'm staring at the very top bulb, and I'm looking dead in the center of it. And I do it sometimes too. You look at the tree. If you're just looking at the tree and you let go and you see amber, there's your 050 light. You have just got drilled. I have just tattooed you to the wall and uh, you'll see me about the quarter panel of my car if we run the same thing all the way down the track. I'm looking at the center of that top amber bulb. I see that thing, boom, five finger discount is gone. I have hopefully treed you. If not, I know it because the first thing I do when I leave the starting line is I look at the tree to make sure the red light isn't on. Uh, at this point, I'm not really doing any driving. If the thing's not on fire, I can't turn the wheel, the gas pedal's down. For about a second and a half is about the most fun and relaxing part of this ride. Uh, make sure the red light's not on. I, look, I glance over out the corner of my eye. If I can see your car, you have left on me and a panic is about to ensue because I gotta run you down. So my elbow's locked into this deal. No steering yet. Uh, I'm waiting to see when it touches the front end down. So I'm, I'm light on the steering wheel. You can feel it when you've driven these things a while, you can feel it exactly when it sets the front end down. Generally, it's not going straight. That's one of the awesome things about pro model racing is they're difficult to drive. This thing goes out there, it sets the front end down, second and a half, two seconds into the run, car's traveling over 100 miles an hour. Um, it's ripping along pretty good. Don't have a, a vast sensation of speed yet, but you can tell through your peripheral that things are moving by pretty quick. Um, at this point, really all I'm focused on is keep this thing in the groove and don't let it get away from you. Anybody can drive one of these cars when everything goes good. Uh, when it doesn't blow up, when the transmission doesn't break in half and shoot an input shaft through your leg or the, or the, it doesn't melt a piston halfway through the run, they're really easy to drive. Uh, when you see runs like that, you're like, man, anybody can do this. What makes an awesome race car driver is making the correct decision when everything goes bad. There's a lot of times where normally the runs where something terrible happens, it's on its best run. That's why you tend to overdrive it. It'll be absolutely hauling butt right before it burns up. Or it'll be hauling tail and it'll break a drive shaft. Those are, the, those are the moments where experience is the only thing that can save you. Uh, we have to have, as drivers, we have to have good reflexes and good instincts. A lot of it's experience. Having been on fire before, uh, you have a different perspective. You also, until you really wreck one of these cars good, it's really hard to get a good grasp of when to quit. Uh, I used to drive these things like a, like a cowboy, and I still do when I have to, but when you pile one up at 250, it'll change your, it'll change your mind about when to get off of it. So one and a half seconds, two seconds is setting the front end down. It's changed one, two gears. You're piled in there pretty good. It's going to run up. It's going to shift to high gear. Generally at this point, I'm, I'm soft on the steering wheel. I like to think about holding an egg when I'm driving it. I never have a death grip on it. You won't ever see me sawing it around a bunch. Uh, generally it's fingertips. Uh, about this point, my hand's going to go straight to the chute handle. Uh, this is my last line of defense. Generally over half the run in a quarter mile run, my hand's right here. Um, if something goes bad, if it cuts a tire, if it gets loose, if it gets into marbles, if it blows up and runs over the rods, the crankshaft falls out, this parachute handle is gonna save me faster than anything else, way faster than the brake pedal, way faster than letting off the gas. That's what's gonna straighten the car up and if it's going to pile into the wall, that's gonna minimize the damage. 
Um, so pretty much from the 330 on, I'm, I'm ready on the, on the parachute. Uh, a lot of people like to run a parachute button on the steering wheel. I don't. I like the lever. Uh, I like to, to manually throw it. Um, always have. This thing's zipping along in high gear. It runs through the eighth mile. It's running about 200 miles an hour. Not really that fast yet. Uh, the craziest thing I can explain to someone who's never ran quarter mile is the difference between 200 and 250. 200 miles an hour, I'm sitting in my Lazy Boy playing Nintendo uh, in my Superman pajamas, and it's just no big deal. 250, you're puckered up, and you're paying attention. Um, it, you just wouldn't think that it's that relative. I can't imagine the difference between 250 and 3, 330. Um, when this thing's zipping along at 1,000 foot, the engine is screaming. You're at 11,000 RPMs. Everything is hot. Everything is ready for you to please step off of it. I'm mashing the gas pedal so hard, I think I'm about to break the firewall in half. Um, this is generally, by the time you get to a thousand foot, for me, I, everybody talks about looking over and seeing him, and I, I generally, at a thousand foot, I'm focused on where I'm going. Uh, not to say that I won't have a peak or two before then. When this thing's getting up to 250 miles an hour, I'm pretty focused on how to properly crash it, or hopefully not crash it, but you're, you're focused on when that bad thing goes down. Um, I drive it into the chutes. I'm, I'm generally early on the chutes. I get yelled at a lot of times because the chute hits going through the lights and it'll gig us a hundredth. Um, when, w one of the hardest things to do driving these is judging the stripe. It took me three or four runs to get the, the timing of running up to the finish line with the chutes to the gas pedal correct. Um, the first time you drive one of these, even if you're an experienced eighth mile pro mod driver, uh, you're not gonna let off when you're supposed to. You're gonna let off about 300 feet before the finish line. You're gonna think you got there. You're gonna look on the graph and man, I'll let off at five four. Uh, you're you're trying to judge it. These things are are going. They're covering distance at such a fast rate of speed. It just takes a little perspective to get it right. Um, generally, by the time I get to the mile per hour cone, I have thrown the chute. And I like, on a perfect run, right when I get to the lights, boom, that thing hits as I'm letting off the gas. Uh, generally, if I'm late to the chutes, it's because something happened. I couldn't get them out. Something was wrong with the cable. They weren't packed correctly. Uh, sometimes the air, the wind will just make it where they don't blossom. Um, but I'm generally right on time on the chutes. Throw the chutes, bam! Uh, the, the, as, as fun and awesome as it feels, taking off, filling that three and four G acceleration, Oh, 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 let me tell you how good it feels when you feel them two big old 10-foot shoots hit. Uh, it's a really big swing. You're zipping along through there about two Gs. Uh, it's about a negative four Gs, negative three, four Gs. It's a big swing. Shoots hit off the throttle. I still haven't touched the brakes. Um, never in the shutdown unless there's a problem do I get more than 200 pounds of brake pressure. And a lot of times it won't be any or it'll be 70 to 80 foot, uh, uh, foot pound, you know, 70 to 80 pounds of brake pressure. Um, light on the brakes. If you stomp the brakes on these things, they got carbon fiber brakes, it will lock the front brakes up and you will immediately pile up the whole race car and flip into the woods. So you want to stay off the brake pedal, shoots out off the throttle. First thing I want to do is kill the ignition. That motor has rode the boat. It has done its job. It's tired. It wants to go to bed. It's probably blown up depending on what round of qualifying it is. Get that motor turned off. Get that thing stopped running as fast as you can. Um, as soon as the engine's off, I'm reaching over, I'm pulling this thing into neutral. To get it into neutral down there, the way we run electronics is we, um, we have basically everything tied into the ignition switch. When I kill the ignition, it dumps the pods off the transmission. I'm allowed to put it in neutral. You still have to get some feel for it. You can't just snatch it in neutral. Um, ease that thing in neutral. I'll generally go, reach up, double check my ignition switch, turn my fresh air off. Uh, I'm not one of the folks that starts taking safety equipment off yet. You're still traveling 180 miles an hour. Um, at this point, the car's bouncing around. Most shutdowns are pretty rough. In a Pro Mod car, it's not uncommon for a chute to come out and snatch the car around, pull the, all four tires off the ground. Uh, it's generally pretty rough, so we're, we're, I'm bouncing around. I'm making sure that they're not going to crash into me and I'm not going to crash into them. Um, and then you're, when you're reaching a turn off, it's a pretty good feeling. You made a good run. You're not on fire. You live to fight another day. Uh, turn around the corner, power off, shoot handle back so it's ready to be packed, CO2 bottle off, uh, take a deep breath, and get out and smile for the camera. Uh, there, there's, your, there's your run. 
and that's just the beginning of it. Uh, guys are there in, a, in about two minutes, uh, get out of the car. Takes about a minute to get all the safety stuff off. We're going to haul it back to the pits. We're going to uh, evaluate race pack data. Billy's down there on the scooter. He's normally got the data card uh, out about the time I get undressed down there. He's headed back to see if we need a crankshaft or not. Uh, we get to do it all over again. It's kind of long-winded. I skimmed over it. There's a lot more to it, uh, but I hope you all enjoyed it um, on what it's like to, to, to make a little rip in the shadow a quarter mile. Thank you.